Thank you for joining the session. Please remain seated as we prepare the stage for the next panel. Please welcome to the stage the panel on The Revival of Consumer Markets, moderated by Alibaba's managing editor of Alizilla, Alison Tudor Aykroyd. Hello everyone. I have to say that this is my dream panel when um, considering this topic, revival of consumer markets in this region. We have Sonia Cheng, Vice Chairman of Chow Tai Fook Jewelry Group and CEO of the Rosewood Hotel Group. We have Jane Sun, Trip.com Group CEO, and Joey Watt, CEO of Yum China. I think everyone in this room will have walked by a Chow Tai Fook store on the streets of Hong Kong, and if you've spent any time at all in this city, um, browse for a flight on trip.com, and in China, eaten at a KFC. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the brands and the companies that we're going to talk to about today. Um, so thank you very much to the Milken Institute for bringing us together. I'm Alison, and I'm going to be your moderator for the next 40 or so minutes, so thank you. First, I think we can agree that um, consumer markets are reviving in fits and starts after the, the depths of the pandemic, and so this panel will focus on the pace and the quality of that revival and the subsectors that are poised to outperform. Um, Actually, turning first to, to you, Joey, if I may, um, Yum China, as the CEO, you are in a perfect position to, to tell us, you know, is the F&B market still a good investment opportunity, given the challenges that the broader economy is facing that have been very well publicized? Um, please tell us. Thank you. Um, you know, not that I'm not biased, I'm slightly biased, <laughs> but I think it's always good to look at certain numbers uh, to evaluate what's the potential of the F&B market. Look, you know, we, we sort of face the GDP growth of 5%. Uh, it's actually not a terrible bad number given the size of economy. If we put things into perspective, I think point one is, uh, what does that mean to have 5%? 5% actually is about 800, 900 billion out of 18 trillion economy. So what is 800, 900 billion here is two Vietnam economy. That is the growth every year. So it's not bad. And China has a 1.4 billion population, that's 0.2. After 36 years working in China, we right now operate in 2,000 cities in China. China has roughly about 3,000 cities right now. Uh, so we are already operating in 2,000 cities, but that's KFC. For Pizza Hut, we only operate in 700 plus cities. So that kind of shows there's still a lot of white, white space for F&B retailer, particularly for chain store. And um, after 36 years, we only are serving one third of Chinese, actually. Only 500 million. It's just a huge market. It's crazy to think about it. And we set the goal right now, uh, by 2026, we hope to serve uh, half of Chinese population because 
we are in restaurant business. We have to open the restaurant and then serve the customer nearby. We can't just ship the, 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 the fried chicken. We, we could, but it won't taste very good. Um, so that, that is uh, point two. Um, and, and therefore, we are not the only one. There are many other um, local player, international player, new player. They're still coming uh, to, to China. And point three is we are still at the early stage of uh, particular chain store development in FMB. Um, so again, we we'll go back to the numbers. Um, I'd like to compare the, 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 the penetration per million people in China versus, let's say, Japan, because it's aging population, and the competition between our business versus, versus very good Japanese food is not a small deal. Um, so, so in Japan, I think McDonald has about 28, 28 store per million people. China right now has seven only. Uh, in Shanghai, we have 21. I'm talking about KFC in China, because in China, KFC actually is the market leader. Um, so KFC in, in, is the only country in the world that that's the case. Um, the, 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 the number of KFC store in Shanghai is 21 store per million people. So somewhere, I think, for the country, it will be sub, somewhere between 7 and 21. So that gives you a sense of the, of the magnitude of the stage of the industry, last but not least, last year. Last year was an, a bit unusual because, it, because it's COVID recovery. Um, before last year, roughly, the restaurant industry growth in the last few years is about high single digit to double digits, about 10%. But 2023, is unusual, but the recovery is not bad. Actually, it was 20%, and our company achieved slightly better than that. Uh, 20%, I'm not gonna complain about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 2026, half of China's population, big numbers. <laughs> yes, we hope, we, right now we have 14,600 stores. We hope, we set the goal, goal that by 2026, we hope to get to 20,000 stores. Yeah. Yeah. To you, Sonia, if I may, um, you wear many hats, and I'm going to ask you to put all of them on and think of a big picture trend. Generational change, is that a challenge or an opportunity for brands in this region? So let's focus on, um, I'll put on my Chow Thai focus okay. uh, <laughs> for now. Um, and looking at the retail industry, um, so what I'm seeing kind of consumer trends now in China um, first of all, I think I'm seeing three trends, uh, three biggest trends. Like number one, um, there's a rise in, in uh, uh, rising interest in gold consumption, mm. um, and uh, and among the younger consumers. Um, and in the past, you'll see the the uh, last generation, the lower generation buying gold, but now the younger consumers are very interested in gold because they're very savvy. Um, they're looking for products that has investment value. Um, so uh, you're seeing a, a significant increase in, in that trend. And in our um, overall retail sales for gold, actually 40% uh, uh, comes from this collection that we have, which is called Hua Collection, which is a modern interpretation of uh, gold jewelry in a much more fashionable sense and everyday wear, uh, targeting the younger consumers. And it accounts for 40% of our overall gold uh, sales value in China. So that really says um, there's a really strong interest uh, among the younger consumers. Um, and half of those uh, uh, buyers are under 35 years old. Hmm. So those are really interesting trends. Um, and then the second trend I would say in China that's happening and continue to happening in the past couple years is uh, the notion of guoqiao, which is national pride. Um, so you're seeing a lot of Chinese brands, local brands really rising. Um, Brands that have a very strong uh, heritage, uh, strong legacy, uh, like Chow Thai Folk, <laughs> um, that has a, 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 a long history to tell, very strong storytelling that resonates with the Chinese consumer, are brands that will do well in China now. Um, and also going back to this collection that we have, which is really speaks to this um, uh, interest in, in, in uh, Chinese culture, um, where our collection uh, really is inspired by different dynasties uh, in China uh, and, and the history, and it really has been doing so well um, among the younger generation. And I would say the third trend that we're seeing uh, in, the, in the Gen Z uh, um, consumer is 
buying for sale reward. So in the past, you know, women probably rely on men buying jewelry and diamonds to, to, uh, to the girls, but nowadays it's the opposite. So we don't rely on men anymore. Um, <laughs> as a celebration of International Women's Month, uh, I would have to say that. Um, but you're seeing a lot of uh, women really, um, uh, you know, because they of the career, because they reach a milestone, they are consuming for themselves. So they don't really depend on others to do that. So we're, we're seeing a huge trend on that, which means that brands are making campaigns and uh, doing their marketing, targeting female consumers. So those are kind of the, the trends I'm seeing cross-generation in China. Thank you, thank you. Just to reinforce, also Alibaba on Timor, we saw that gold trend during the recent Valentine's Day campaign, people buying that as a store of, uh, of, of um, value. Um, Jane, turning to you, if I may. Um, we just witnessed the world's largest human migration in the Spring Festival when people travel around the world. Could you tell us what is your biggest takeaway from that um, and what does it mean for the wanderlust of Chinese consumers? Mm. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Chinese travelers are very much taught uh, to travel. Our teaching has been uh, by Confucius uh, that it is better to travel 10,000 miles than to read 10,000 books. So parents would love to bring kids to travel and to learn. So during the past Chinese New Year, we have seen a huge pickup uh, in Chinese travel industry. For domestic travel, we exceeded 2019 by 60 percent. Uh, for outbound travel, we looked at both demand side and supply side. On the demand side, based on our search volume, it far exceeded 2019 level already. However, on the supply side, we still have two major hurdles. The first one is the visa application is still taking too long. The second one is the flight capacity only recovered 50 percent. However, I think this year will be a huge year to recover fully for the outbound travel. Uh, during the Chinese New Year, people who go to Australia, New Zealand, and uh, South Africa uh, become the most uh, popular uh, destination uh, when we compare two uh, different uh, travel destinations. And going forward, Europe, GCC countries in the Middle East, and of course Asia, America will be very popular as well. Uh, and the third element is that China also have an open door policy now. Uh, we offer the free visa to many European countries such as Switzerland, Ireland, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, etc. So we are welcoming more inbound customers to get to know China better. Okay. So noted a big year for outbound travel, you reckon? Mm, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, okay, popular topic. I'm going to turn to AI now. I mean, it has been touted the world over as a growth opportunity and a way to clamp down on costs. Um, tell me, is the future now in China? Or is it, is it just a gimmick? Um, Jane, can I, can I sure. pick your brains? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, we invest heavily in mm. AI. Uh, there are four areas which we feel we can uh, benefit from AI. Uh, the first one is user interface. Uh, for example, in the past, uh, when we come to Hong Kong, I will say, oh, I need a five-star hotel. I have two children with pets with a swimming pool. And then you need to put in different filters in order for the right property to serve. Uh, Right now, you can just talk to our trip genie, tell them what you need, and the results will automatically pop up. So that saves a lot of time for our customers and enhance the user interface. The second one is the coding time. Our engineers uh, can save anywhere between 15 to 30 percent for their coding time. Uh, so that is also enhancing our productivity. The third one is the customer service level. Uh, when we get phone calls from all over the world, our AR enable our customer service team to identify what our customer needs and promote the right product to increase the uh, conversion rate. And lastly, uh, with Sora, I think the uh, content generation will be more effective and efficient. So we're very excited for the AI development. 
So not giving so real real life use cases, improving Absolutely. user experience. Yeah. Um, so, Joey, I know Yum China has been growing at breakneck speed. Um, has AI helped you? I don't know. Uncork some of those bottlenecks in your journey. Is it the, the corporates out there? Can they employ it usefully? Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm with Jane. Like in terms of coding, customer service. All these are uh, already happening. Um, and then the marketing uh, content generation, uh, definitely. Uh, but what, what else in our business? Well, first of all, AIGC is relatively new. AI is not. Uh, we, start, we have a very big company-wide program starting from 2015. 2015, we start the, the moment they have the digital payment with Alibaba, and then from facing, uh, so the customer facing the membership. So now we have 470 million members in our system in China. It got to be one of the largest in, in our business in the world. And then, so all these interaction, is our, it's location based. So customer get close to our store, we start to interact with them. Um, and then we move to the store operation uh, right now, all our store, we have AI to help uh, when to prepare chicken, uh, how many staff, how many hours do we need, um, and then the operation of the equipment, or IoT, IoT AI, so that the maintenance, everything, and then when to turn on, off the, the, the switch to save some electricity. And the most difficult bit, which is also the uh, most important bit, is the supply chain. So now we complete the journey to have the uh, AI and digital, digitization process, not only for warehouse, for our supply chain, and with all of our suppliers. And that allow us to run a store without touching the, the stock, the full ingredient. Everything is, is, is clear. So there's a reason why, during, even during the pandemic, uh, we m minimize the food wastage, and we also can, can send the food to the right place at the right time, which is incredibly important. And most importantly, food safety. Food safety, food safety. The important things we have to talk about three times. <laughs> um, food safety is so important, and that's a reason why in the past that we've been quite conservative about franchising, because we worry about food safety. But now, with the full AI uh, support supply chain system, we feel more comfortable. So we are going to up the percentage of the franchising store. Now we still only have 10% of store of a franchises store. We run this, uh, uh, these stores ourselves. Therefore, we have 430,000 people on our payroll. Uh, but going forward, we can do more franchising because now the food safety is under control. But how does that help us going further? Actually, the last four years has been the highest speed of our development for our company despite the pandemic. Um, because one thing, there are many, many terrible things during the pandemic. Huh? We, we wish it never happened, but it did happen. So we might as well take some good advantage out of it. And one big advantage we did take out of it is not that many people fight with us to have a good location to open stores. Hmm. And the rent too. So our rent as a percentage right now is the best in the last 10 years. And we have really, really good location, really good deal, and we built good trust with the landlord. And I would like to believe that we are one of the best tenants in China right now, because we always pay the rent, including <laughs> during the pandemic. <laughs> Landlord. <laughs> so so, so the, the biggest obstacle, or biggest um, bottleneck for us to open good store, not only more store. Good store is more important than more store. The biggest bottleneck is good people, good store manager. I mean, we are a cash-rich company. We don't take on that. Um, so, so how does this AI thing work? Because now there are many process, like our, our, our store manager will have a watch, and the watch will tell them when to do what, to remind them. It's up to them to decide when to do what, but the watch will tell them. And then the, the, the supply chain, the staffing, is all AI driven. So for the first time in the last 36 years, our store manager not only can manage one store, but two store, three store, four store, but depending on their capability, not everyone. But that not only save the cost, but 
it really opened up a different universe about how many store, how many good store can we open and can we run. And among everything that we, we aspire to in our, in our company, the number one thing in our culture is RGM number one, store manager number one. We organize our entire company Headquarters called Restaurant Service Center to serve the store, to serve the store manager. So that is huge for us. Thank you, thank you. And we've heard how um, AI can empower the consumer and businesses, um, but are there limits? Um, Sonia, does the luxury consumer prefer high tech or high touch? <laughs> Um, so I would, I would have a more balanced view there. Um, I think that no doubt AI is uh, going to be super beneficial to many organizations and companies in terms of cost saving, in terms of operational efficiencies. Um, but I also believe that in the hospitality industry or you know, the luxury retail sector, um, more and more so nowadays, consumers, how customers are um, really preferring uh, uh, human interactions, that human touch, uh, that uh, personal, personalized experience, um, uh, more than just a transactional experience. They, they want to spend time at the hotel or a retail store. They want to um, uh, uh, have a personal connection whether with the sales staff or whether with our hotel staff and hotel. And those are the experiences that will actually um, make them come back and become really loyal customers to our brands. Um, so I, I do have a more balanced view between the two. Um, having said that, you know, at Rosewood, we do use a lot of AI, um, uh, mostly in the uh, back operation, really helping our uh, team members uh, with more data-driven analytics to understand and predict uh, our customers' behavior, understanding the preferences in advance so that we can take care of them better, um, and also allowing our, our staff to spend more time in front of the house and actually have more of those human connection and human interactions with our customers, which is more valuable um, uh, uh, for our guests. And then on the retail side, uh, we do use a lot of AI to understand you know, what products actually sell um, uh, in our stores uh, so that we can actually uh, run a, a much more op uh, operational efficient supply chain. I mean, for retail, the most important thing is your inventory turn, right? Your inventory turn has to be as low as possible to be very efficient as an, uh, as an operation and how you're working on your cash. Um, and so the more accurate that you know about what products actually sell at what point and what time uh, will help replenish those items uh, much more in a timely manner. Uh, and if we know those trends and know those data, then we can send those uh, 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 production uh, requests to our supply chain much earlier in advance, um, and hence helping the supply chain and making it much more efficient. So overall, I would say that we definitely need these technology. We need this, uh, uh, the AI uh, to, to be a much more efficient organization. But I would say in the luxury sector, um, because we spend you know, customers in our space, whether it's in Chow Thai folk because the value is higher, or whether it's a road would, um, the, the time value in those locations uh, is much longer than, say, in a KFC, right? So the human connection and that human relationship is very, very important. Good to hear. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Joey, at uh, Timul and Taobao Group, we have noted um, a value for money. Uh, trend in amongst Chinese consumers, mm. they want to see more value for mm. their for their buck. Um, how how do you see this playing out? Consumption downgrade, upgrade, um, yeah. And okay, I can't stop. What's your recipe for success in China? <laughs> um, we do serve a lot of customer. We we we. Typically, we do 1.6 billion transactions a year. That will mean 2 billion customers we serve a year. Uh, so we do learn a lot from them. Um, I think for, for us, uh, uh, it, the number one thing is we, we continue to learn from them, be very, very humble. Um, you know, particularly after the pandemic, customers' behavior have 
change a little bit. So someone clever said we need to relearn and reconnect with a customer. I, I like that. I like that. Uh, I'll give you one example, um, and then I'll talk. I'll come to the what we have concluded about the few things we need to get it right. Value for money does not mean cheap price. Really, does not. It means really good quality. It means affordable price. It means food safety. It means convenience. It means some emotional value as well. So customer want all of these above and good price. Yes. What's wrong about it? What's wrong about it? It's okay. And it's up to us to, to deliver it. Um, and competition is intense, and someone can deliver, someone cannot. Um, so I'll give you one example about uh, our whole chicken business. We, we sell whole chicken in, in KFC in China. When we started, Two or three years ago, we sold like 200,000 whole chicken, and last year we sold 50 million of those. And that is about half of the sales of original recipe chicken that we've been selling in China for the last 36 years. That's how big the category is. How did that thing come out? Well, we noticed, well, that's during the pandemic in particular, but even after the pandemic, we realized Customers, uh, weekend sales is a bit depressed. And you, we can complain about it or we just do something about it. So why? Well, there's, there are two reasons. One is, you know, in the past, a lot of business come from tutoring. Tutoring business, parents and kids need some, you know, convenient food, convenient and safe food. Uh, and, and we know what happened to the tutoring business. It creates some uh, pressure on our business. But more importantly, after three-year pandemic, people are used to stay at home. So we can't expect customers just like suddenly change their mind and, and come out during weekend every day. It's not, it's not happening. We, and we have to respect that. So we realize customers are staying at home. So our product, Whole Chicken, is designed to, uh, to, to it's be perfect choice because we chose a smaller chicken um, for a small family in, 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 in China. Have a whole chicken, some vegetables, some rice, maybe some little pickle, whatever. Perfect meal. Perfect meal. And nothing wrong about it. So we built and built and built the business. It's designed for home consumption. And right now, our weekend business is back. It's doing well. That's how we react to it. But it's not only just cheap product. It's really something that customers need now. And they have customers will continue to change. And we'll continue to, to change with them, just like what Sonia say about women will now buy the jewelry ourselves. Why not? Um, so value for money, I think people somehow associate that with price war. Terrible idea. It will never work. But it's something more. So whenever we introduce, well, to give you a sense, even during the pandemic, now, of course, after, KFC and Pizza, a year, we still launch 500 new food to the customer, 500. Every week, you come to our shop, there will be something new. It's completely crazy. No one else will do that outside China. Uh, but our staff are good, smart, hardworking, and we love good food, so why not? And you think, if you think that 500 is crazy enough, our team actually innovate 5,000 food a year. Um, only 10% we ever got launched, and I taste probably half of it. It's, so it's one of my most preferred jobs is to taste a lot of food, but it's also one of the biggest challenges challenge not to get too fat, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 5,000, and you choose 500, 500 product launches. Yeah. Big numbers. Um, given the caliber of um, expertise in hospitality and tourism on this panel, um, it would be remiss of me not to ask, when do you think that the Chinese consumers Tourists will be the biggest spenders again in the world. How quickly? I'm going to go to you first, Jane, if I sure. may, on that one. Sure. Uh, Chinese consumers love to buy gifts for their family when they are on road. So I was just in Dubai, and the team told me that Trip.com customer, their buying power is three times 
as much as the average spender. So they love to attract our customers to Dubai Airport and they love to keep them as long as possible. Uh, so the buying power is very strong. Uh, right now we just need to make sure we have tailored uh, product for our customers. Uh, for example, our young customers, uh, they are very interested in concerts, uh, music festivals. Our old, we, older generation, we call silver hair generation, that's the first generation which have time and they have money. Uh, so they are also are very interested in high-end product at the time they want to. Uh, cruise industry is booming uh, for this type of customers. And then we also have white collar, gold collar uh, consumers. So luxury products like the beautiful hotel as Rosewood uh, is very popular in our gold collar, white collar families. So we want to make sure we present the right product at the right level to make sure all the customers find their tailor-made products. And we've all watched with great interest the, the um, growth and number of Rosewood, sumptuous Rosewood hotels um, grow around the world. Could you tell us a little bit about that expansion plan, next steps maybe, and what that tells us about the, um, the growth in Chinese consumer um, tourism. I mean, we're looking at this big outbound trend, hopefully this year. Are you seeing that and will you follow it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, year on year, in terms of our Chinese consumer going outbound and our entire portfolio grow probably about 20% year on year. Um, and uh, you know, currently, Rosewood Hotel Group manages uh, 48 properties around the world in 23 countries, and we have about 32 uh, uh, new hotels under construction in the pipeline. We are expanding quite quickly in Europe, uh, where we're opening this year, Amsterdam, in uh, Rome, Milan. Uh, we're also growing in the Middle East, uh, where a lot of the Chinese consumers are actually going. Um, where we're going to be opening in Riyadh, we're opening a resort in Red Sea. Uh, we're also entering into Japan this year for the first time, um, opening a resort in Miyako just off Okinawa. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, 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 robust expansion plan coming up. Um, but in terms of Chinese consumer and, and, and their behavior and their preferences, what we're seeing are a few things, right? Number one, um, we're seeing that um, there's an uptick in uh, Chinese uh, travelers going to uh, properties that are a little bit off the beaten track. Uh, more experiential, smaller properties. Mm -hmm. So you would still have a lot of business in the Paris and the London, uh, the New York, right? But you're seeing an uptake, significant uptake in places like Laos, uh, Rosewood Luang Prabang, um, in Castellon de Bosco, which is our Rosewood property in Tuscany. We just opened uh, our New Zealand three lodges uh, of 20 rooms in New Zealand. It's a quite a trek to get there, um, but it's amazing uh, when, once you get there. And we saw a lot of interest uh, from the Chinese consumers inquiring about those, uh, those properties. So what does it say? It says that you know, Chinese consumers are going to the first tier cities, but they are also um, uh, really interested in discovering new places, new destinations. If you look at last year, right, um, in China, I think one, was the, one of the biggest hit uh, over Christmas was Harvey. Mm. the ice festival. Mm. Um, so instantly, you know, all of Xiaohongshu, you will see <laughs> everyone flocking to, to, to Harbin with their, you know, snow hats and all that. I was, I was almost one of them. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the negative 20 degree was scaring me off. Um, but uh, the, the Beijing, Shanghai, Chengdu, you know, Guangzhou, they're still going to be attractive. Uh, but more so Chinese travelers, they're very curious. They're very uh, uh, savvy when they travel. They want to learn something new. They want to discover. So these places where it um, uh, gives them a new experience, uh, a new journey, are also very attractive to them. I think the second trend uh, with the Chinese consumer is um, you're seeing a rise of uh, independent brands in, in China. Mm. Um, so uh, obviously, you know, Rosewood still have you know, our appeal, uh, but there are a lot of independent boutiques in China that are attracting a lot of the younger consumers. Um, they're not necessary in the main cities. So they're, again, off a little bit, so maybe an hour from Shanghai, and then people will, will go to uh, 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 those hotels. You're also seeing a rise of guest houses and beautiful guest houses in Yunnan, in Guizhou. We call them Minshu. Um, so there are in, uh, a different uh, category.
luxury, let's say, uh, of uh, uh, hotels are rising that are really uh, uh, catching our interest. I, I, I think you would also agree that there's that experiential uh, trend, and um, Alibaba's Fliggy has noted it as well. Um, and yes, Harbin was big, uh, wasn't um, those North South snow holidays? Right, and, yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm going to move to a lightning round now. Um, so you guys have multiple choice, you have to pick an answer. Um, and just with a, a I'll answer with a quick phrase. Um, so, what quantum of growth do you expect in your sector within China's consumer market over the next five years? Okay, I'm going to start low. 0 to 5%, 5 to 10%, or 10 to 20%? Joey? Um. Probably we will be high single digit. That's also how we set our growth target in the coming three years. High single digit to hopefully double digit system sales, yeah. 10 to 20%? Whoa. <laughs> uh, I will not pick a quantum, if mm -hmm. I may. Uh, I would say I'm just cautiously, cautiously optimistic. I think that China uh, demand will not be a problem, right? It's all about you know what brands, quality brands that will really uh, lead the pack um, uh, in China. Okay. Um, next multiple round choice, and let me know why you're picking this one. So, which trend? as a CEO, are you paying most attention to right now? Is it AI, generational change, or consumption upgrade? Um, I'm not sure of fitting into any one of these. The, the, the biggest thing is, will be the consumption, uh, the, the consumer um, what we call changing the consumer occasion uh, that that is changing it could change really fast mm -hmm. and that's our biggest challenge how can we stay so close uh, to that change and then and then immediately uh, do something and to take advantage of the change yeah, generational change for travel. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it represents the future. Uh, we need to invest in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, what we have already seen today, we already have the right product to tailor uh, these trends. It, we always focus on the future. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing, is there, going back to that experiential change, mm -hmm. are younger mm -hmm. people maybe a little bit more adventurous in Absolutely. their travel? Absolutely. So in the old days, uh, if you give a new uh, a group tour, we package the deal, and customers are very happy. Now young people are very adventurous, right? In the winter, they want to ski. In the summer, they want to dive. Uh, they like sports. They like Taylor Swift. We need to grasp all these trends and have the product to tailor uh, these young trends. So you saw people traveling to Singapore for the Taylor oh, Swift concert, Big time. Did you? Big time. <laughs> Sonny and I were talking about how we can grasp these trends to bring more customers to Hong Kong. Taylor Swift's helping. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, please, Sonia. Um, I would say generational change. Um, I, I think that uh, you know, consumer trends in the younger generation, they really, they, their, their taste, their style, what they're looking for, changing very fast. So you really have to monitor. And what I am observing is that there are a couple things. Number one is, um, you know, if you look at, because I wear two hats, right? I, I, I'm in the retail industry. I'm also in the hospitality interest, industry. But what's really interesting is that nowadays, um, uh, there, in, the, in the past, it's very siloed. It's very uh, segregated. Retail is retail, hospitality is hospitality. But if you look at how retail brands are changing nowadays and how they are innovating to entice younger consumers to be to resonate with the brand, to feel more relevant, is they are entering into the hospitality space. So you see retail brands, you know, not just a standalone store anymore. A retail transaction is just not enough for for a consumer, they are branching into the hotel space. They're building hotels, they're building cafes, they're building uh, you know, different type of pop-ups and to give different experiences to consumers. And you're seeing hotel space and hospitality 
also going into the retail space, and not just retail, right? Art, culture, we're celebrating Art Basel this week. Rosewood yesterday just had an event where we invited, you know, we, we had a, uh, uh, an event uh, partnering with Serpentine. So there's a lot of cross-industry collaborations, and, and, and the line is, is getting more murky, and this is driven by consumers really um, uh, uh, thriving for new experiences and, 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 and to entice them. And then I think the second thing that I'm seeing and we're watching really closely and I find very intriguing in China is the rise of local brands. Not just from a national pride perspective, but also local brands, whether it's in automobile, whether it's in F&B, whether it's in, you know, uh, you know, uh, technology, phones, right, or uh, retail brands, uh, sportswear, right, you see this huge rise of successful local brands trumping international brands in China, but why? Because they're much more in the pulse of what's happening in China, how younger consumers are, are buying, how do you market to younger consumers, uh, they're much more quick, they're much more agile, and it's very interesting how in the last five years, these rise of local brands, which you never thought they can com compete with those international brands or actually become fierce competitions to the international brands. And in fact, the international brands, if you look at the you know, last two years of a lot of these cross collaborations in China, international brands are snatching local brands and asking them to collaborate with them. And cross sectors, not just luxury to luxury, luxury to mass, right? You have the Haiti crossing with a Gucci just mm -hmm. launched two weeks ago. Right? So it's really interesting trends are coming out, and it just shows that we constantly have to be really on the pulse with the trend and really be in touch with what the young consumers are looking for. Thank you, everybody, for your insights. Much appreciated. And one thing I just wanted to note, I think we're still in international women's Bye. month um, <laughs> this month, and for the young uh, women out there just starting their careers. I mean, what an inspirational panel we have here. So I just wanted to note that and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. And thank you everybody for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Milken Institute gratefully acknowledges the participation of the following organizations. Without their generosity, our work and the Global Investors Symposium would not be possible.